Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Aaron Bieber of Aaron Bieber Knives. I've been following Aaron on Instagram for a while now, first drawn in by his very unique Pical style fixed blade called the DMF. Uh, but soon I discovered his ultra refined EDC long clip fighter, that's my description, called the 302 with Japanese handle wrap and varying grinds and finishes from blade to blade. While sharking around Blade Show, I spotted a case filled with 302s, and then I introduced myself to the man that made them, and then things got interesting right away. We'll talk all about Aaron's work and how he found himself making knives, but first be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and if you would, share the show. That's a great way to help spread the word about how well, how wonderful and wholesome knives are. And as always, if you want to help support the show, the quickest way to do that is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and see what we have to offer there. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a knife junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your knife junkies merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. Aaron, welcome to the show, sir. Hi, Bob. How you doing there? Great. How are you tonight? <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So, uh, congratulations on a successful blade show. You told me you had a, a pretty bang up time there. It was uh, the best. Yeah. Tell tell me right. all about it. Well, it was my first time doing blade show, so I, I didn't know what to expect except a massive knife show, and finally being able to meet people like you there. Um, uh. It was, I mean, just everything about it. I, I joke around with my friends and say it was like fear and loathing, fear and loathing in Las Vegas kind of experience. But um, it, it was just great. I mean, I was up late. I did a lot of networking. I met a lot of new friends, a lot of friends that I had only talked to online. Um, I got to say the guy that I kind of shadowed the whole time, my, my, my friend, uh, John Gray, um, he was fabulous through the whole experience. Um, you know, getting me in, involved with with other makers. Um, late show. I'm looking forward to next year already. Just just to meet people and have a great time again. Yeah, you know, I uh, the the I've been. This was my third year, and first year was overwhelming and an overwhelmingly positive experience. But second year and third year, I came home and I was like, man. I kind of wish it could be Blade Show like all the time because I feel so comfortable. I'm so in my element, and everyone here, you know, uh, if 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 they're not cool, they're at least unoffensive. Like it is such a great crowd, such a great space, and filled with you know those things that that have us just going crazy, calling ourselves junkies. Yeah, it's <laughs> pretty accurate. <laughs> So in in my intro, I I, uh, I said things got interesting. Uh, we very quickly discovered that we both went to the same art school, and we both sort of ascertained we're around the same age. I don't think we were there at the same time. I think you were there at, at a different time than I was. But um, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, uh, a great place, great experience I had there. But really, a small I, it felt like a small world meeting you and then just talking with you now it ends up you live in the town where my girlfriend used to live uh, when you know back in the day when i was dating her so very very interesting uh, to to see those sort of parallels uh, tell me okay so you obviously love knives you're you're spending all your time making them tell me how how it developed uh, i assume it came out of the the handsiness of making artwork but it's a different thing than making artwork tell me how you came to make knives well Okay. Um, I had made a few when I was younger, uh, maybe two or three when I was, you know, maybe in my early teens. Um, I was hanging out with some friends. They took me to a, a dojo. They had some, some weapons there and some knives. And I saw some of the, the tantos and stuff on the walls. And I kind of really got like sucked right in. 
So what, like, because, you know, I'm a kid, I can't get my mom or dad to go buy me a Tanto or something. So the best, the next best thing I could do was make one, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, I had always liked knives, you know, being in the Boy Scouts and just, it was just how I was, you know, um, my grandfather gave me my first knife, you know, a K bar from World War II. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, that, that, you know, that was my first knife and I just have been attracted to him ever since. So, um, you know, so I made someone I was younger. I kind of got out of it. I went through, you know, a rough stretch in life, I'll call it, or an adventure. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I made my way out of that tunnel. And about five years ago, a friend of mine said, hey, check it out. I, I just had a knife made. You know, he commissioned a knife. He showed it to me. And I was like, this is awesome. And this is what I've been looking for. You know, so... so Next thing you know, I'm doing homework and I got sucked into reading about metallurgy and, you know, what kind of tools do people use? And I'm just grabbing any kind of tool I had around my house or my parents' house that that remotely would help me make a knife. And next thing you know, I'm grinding with a two by, uh, I mean, like a, like a three by 18 inch belt mm. sander that I had flipped on its back, you know, grinding with the edge away from me in one direction and then towards me in the other direction and, you know, making a little forge to heat treat and anneal. And, um, yeah, I just got sucked right in. <laughs> well, so how, uh, when you were studying art, what, what was the, what was the discipline within fine arts that you studied and how do you see it, um, coming to fruition in your knives, if at all? Actually, it's, it's, it's really funny because I was a painting major at the academy. Painting was probably the thing that I did the least of. <laughs> I, I liked making stuff, you know, fabricating, building. Mm -hmm. And even though I was a painting major, every one of the critics, I mean, you, you remember how, you know, you would have critics come into your studio and they talk to you about your work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, they all just rolled with it. They're like, you're a painting major, but clearly you like making stuff you're more of a sculptural kind of person. And I'm like, yeah, I was like, I'm not going to change my major now, but this is, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. And um, so just, uh, you know, being able to th think something through, you know, have, have a little bit of a vision of where you want it to go and, um, you know, learning what kind of tools to use and what's going to get you the best result. Um, like some of that definitely, um, you know, has played off and uh, some of the instructors, you know, you know, they said, you know, if you're going to do something that everybody else is doing, the only thing you can do is do it better. And I'm not saying I do it better than anybody, but like internally, I constantly want to do better than I've done before. So right. that's my, you know, that's how I look at it. You know, uh, one, one thing um, that, I see in my life, uh, even though I'm not painting, you know, I, I do it occasionally or I'll go through little spells. Uh, I always have something creative going on in my life. Uh, this is a big part of that. Um, but uh, I will I will find that um, without without that outlet, it's uh, it's not a good it's not good. You know, you just you always have to have something that you're uh, building up, putting something into and, uh, you know, making stuff out of. And. Uh, when you start building tools instead of artwork, I feel like something changes. Now I say that because I've made 20 knives in my life, these famous 20 knives I'm always talking about. And they're, you know, done in my shed and they took a long time to make and they're no good, but they, they taught me some things. And one thing I remember is when I'm working on a number of things, I work on a number of things at once, you know, and um, instead of taking one thing all the way from start to finish and then starting another one, I guess it's just an efficiency thing. But that started with uh, with fine art. Um, I, I don't know why I felt uh, I was just curious if, if any I, of that. I think, I think you're on point there when you're doing things in multiples. What you I, I think, you know, as far as how I work, I, I learn more if I'm working on three, three, three things at the same time. If they're all the same, the, pr the progress from the first one to the, to the last one, you know, by the time I'm doing the stuff in the last one, everything's going quicker, cleaner, grinds are nicer. I feel more comfortable about something. But if I'm working on a couple different kinds of builds, um, 
I just got to process everything that much quicker and, and not question it, just like go with it. And, um, I remember maybe you've heard this story, but there was a, an art teacher. He gave his, he had, he split his class in half and he said, you know, this half, I want you to make masterpieces. This half, I want you just to produce as much work as you can. And at the end of all this, we're going to grade the work and critique it. And the people that did the masterpiece work did not have the same quality as the people that did the quantity. And I guess maybe that's just because of getting used to it, getting in the flow and the rhythm and letting things happen instead of just being so ultra focused. Right, right. And when you're thinking, I'm going to make a masterpiece, you never do. You know, it, yeah. it is it is that showing up, so to speak, that concept of just yeah. showing up and putting in the work and then eventually, oh, my gosh, look at all the work I've done and look at what I've learned from here to here. So, OK, so if people know what we're talking about if they're not already following you. Let's let's take a look first at that uh, DMF I mentioned, if you have one handy, because this was the one that uh, caught my eye in my Pakal phase, I, which uh, is permanent. Let's see. I've got. So I've got two variations. Well, they're both the same life, but one is, you know, the uh, seems uh, seems he's frozen up there for a second. All right, let's see. You're back. Okay, I'm back. So, <laughs> all right. So there are two different versions here. Same knife, but different yeah. uh, embodiments. Different finish. Different materials. So, so this, you know, is that's nah, so cool. So this is a very uh, unique uh, um, style of pickle. We've seen reverse tanto pickles, but I've never seen an actual tanto pickle, and and that's what I would call that. I I think it's uh, stunning, and it reminds me of a shark. But the one I like even more is the one in your left hand with the jigged bone. It's so, um, well, you know, it's so modern meets traditional here. Definitely. I, I, I feel the same way. Just, just bringing that, you know, that, that jig bone, old popcorn style jig bone yeah. together with, you know, this, the, the modern blade, you know, in the tactical groups, it just, you know, it worked, yeah. you know, it worked out. So are all of your knives uh, in this? I mean, this is very much a tactical knife. Of course, you could use it for utility. It'd be great. You know, just reorient it in your hand. It'd be great for utility. But um, that in the 302, uh, which is one that I see a lot of on your page, it seems to be your flagship model, maybe. I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but. Um, right now, uh, that's, yeah, that's. that's yeah. One a lot of people are uh, giving attention to. Both have a very um, sort of self defense feel. I got to say, Eric, do you have a 302 handy that you could show up so people know what I'm talking about there? Yes, I do. Yeah. So I called it in my open a, a long clipped fighter. Uh, I, I don't know what you call it, but to me, I, 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 I see that and it's, it's I, built for speed. Built for speed. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I really, it, it definitely can be used as a defensive knife you know some of the geometry you know the heel on the blade that lets you you know you mm -hmm. know your palm come right up to it without cutting you know, poking yourself and being uncomfortable so you can get a real good master grip on it um but just for you know everyday utility it's you know it's comfortable yeah um this i mean right now this is my favorite design um I've been carrying, I made two prototypes. I've been carrying one of the prototypes for, uh, for months now, months on end. It's the fixed blade that I'm carrying. Right. Um, I mean, that's how happy I am with it. You know, I don't know it's on me. Uh, it doesn't print, you know, just with a simple t-shirt, you know, I'll, I'll go uh, with the belt loop. Mm -hmm. So I'm carrying horizontally a, a appendix. Um, it's light, so really, it's it's not burdensome. Um, you know, if I jump on the couch, I don't know it's there. It doesn't right. press into my to my gut or hip or at, you know abdomen. Nothing. It's it's just really comfortable carry. And to me, that is that's like a game changer. Like, yeah, this knife doesn't stay in my sock drawer. 
Right. I carry it and use it. So I have been um, being honest with myself about some of my uh, the knives that I have, and and it's the ones that I keep noticing myself carrying over and over. I don't want to get rid of the other ones. I love them all, uh, but the ones that I keep carrying are those. You know, we're in summertime now, and and I always have a fixed blade on me. And light is the name of the game. Light and flat is the name of the game. And I've been, I've moved. I used to be at three o'clock, and I've moved it around uh, to the front. And uh, yeah, a knife like that that doesn't print is is priceless because you're not going to be worried about it you're going to have it on you and like you said with the 302 you forget it's on you until you need a knife and then you're like oh yeah so when i when i look I at forget that it's on me yeah. yeah i'm like where did i leave it i'm like yeah oh. anyone got a knife you're like not me oh, oh, it's, oh it's right here <laughs> uh, but one thing that's striking to me about the 302 especially i i, I think all of the ones i've seen are in that sukamaki wrap um, there's a very east meets west feel to that knife because the blade itself reminds me of a Bowie or a or, or a fighter, a Western style fighter, and then the handle with that uh, Sukamaki treatment, and then also the angle of the blade to the handle is sort of far eastern, like reminds me a little bit of the Filipino style uh, knives. Tell me about the the inspirations that that brought you to this design. Well, the if I was to trace the profile and that's, and that's how this, this happened. I traced the profile. Um, the 302 is actually a folder design. Oh. Um, that actually, I, I don't have the template or anything here, but I'm hoping next week to actually be able to put the, put the pedal to the metal about making something happen with it. But I was playing with folder ideas and, um, I changed a few lines. Uh, I put that little um, swept ridge uh, on the back of the spine on the you know the forward part of the blade, mm -hmm. and um, I was really happy overall. You know, with proportions and the size that I wanted this folder to be at. I didn't want it to be a giant folder. I don't didn't want it to be a micro. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be around seven inch, seven and a half inch overall length. You know, open. And I find, you know, I had a design that I liked there. Um, one day um, I'm working on some stuff and I just happened to trace the whole design, just the profile silhouette of, you know, the folder open. And it hit me that this really might work well as a fixed bleed also. And next thing you know, I got the bug up my butt. It was right before <laughs> a show. It was about a week before a show. I said, I got to get two of these done like now. So the next thing you know, like I'm staying up late, grinding, heat treating, doing everything. And um, so that's how the first two came about. And um, one of those I ended up keeping just as a reference, because, you know, if I'm going to do something, you know, multiple times, I want to have like a solid reference in front yeah. of me. It's just not a drawing. Um, so I kept the one and uh, yeah, I've been going with it since. You know, I'm really happy with the design, and I can't wait to do the folder. Um, so I'm, yeah. You're, you're, you're ready to go with that folder. It looks now. Now, when I'm looking at it, I can imagine how that folder is going to be. Uh, look, I think it's going to be damn cool. I, th I think there's something, um, even in maybe especially in creative um, pursuits, where a deadline um, really puts your feet to the fire and you got to come up with something. And when it comes to creativity and creative people, it's an ego thing too. You don't want to show up empty handed, you know, Oh, I, I'm a knife designer, but I, I just couldn't, you know, quite come up with a knife. No, that does not, that does not fly. So there's something about that pressure and that timing thing uh, that I think helps creative people. When you were getting ready for blade show, what was your, what was your process? Cause you hadn't been there. You didn't know what to expect in terms of, how many people were going to buy or, or that kind of thing. How did you prep for it? Uh, well, I mean, as far as customers, like, I mean, I, I approach any show as I would like to call it a financial success, but it, it's, I, I just want to go have a good time, meet people mm -hmm. and, and have a good time, you know, just be around other life people. Um, as far as prepping for blade, I knew what designs I, I was going to bring. And, um, I had a lot of like, uh, DMF blanks, 
uh, here that were um, halfway finished, you know, that, that I was working on to bring to the show, the 302s and the paranoias. I was on a little bit of a crunch because I had, I you know, I had uh, the template and uh, the templates for both of those designs. I sent them out about a month and a half before Blade Show. Mm. So I needed them back and heat treated, giving me enough time to, uh, to to get them done. And, you know, fortunately, you know, they, they got back uh, maybe a month before Blade or three weeks. Um, I just put my nose down and went to work. <laughs> So, so what is your process? It sounds like um, you have them, the blanks water jetted or something. Uh, yeah, I have them cut, and, and then for for a larger for larger runs, um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll have stuff uh, you know cut and heat treated it, at, you know outside. I'll outsource that um, because I mean, for me to sit there and grind twenty of twenty thirty whatever number of the same profile, yeah, I mean that's painful. Yeah. And well, then, that's also no way to make money. <laughs> it's, it's I mean, a waste. Of, I mean, it, it's 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 a financial killer. I think yeah. you know. I mean, I would spend so much money on abrasives and time. I mean, time's time is the biggest time. Yeah. You know. Um, so I mean, it's an investment that I have to make when I, you know, have stuff cut and outsourced heat treat and all that. But yeah. it's just part of the game. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just part of what I need to do to you know keep moving forward. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, grinding the knives, um, I feel, I feel comfortable grinding knives, uh, you know, once in a blue moon, I'll butcher something. I mean, I'm human and I mean, I just, I, I butchered one really good, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago and, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to have six knives here to finish up this week. And then an hour later, it's, oh, I'm going to have five knives oh, to finish up this man. week. But that's, you know, I, I've learned it's just, it's none of that stuff isn't the end of the world. Yeah. You know, I learned something and, uh, and I move on. Yeah, waste is a part of every process period. And, and, you know, um, sometimes, I mean, I've heard knife makers say that, and, you know, I've done this in plenty other parts of my uh, life is that you can discover something really cool from your mistakes. Like, Oh, wow. I had no idea. I wanted to make a keychain knife. This started as a Bowie, but uh, you know, yeah, oh, dude, mistakes, happy mistakes. <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. Happy accidents. It's, yeah, it's, uh, and just learning from them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, that kind of stuff is priceless. You know, you gotta, you know, you gotta spend some time behind the wheel and mess up a little. And I mean, for me, that's how I work. And when I mess up, I get a little bothered, but I, I don't want to dwell on it. You know, I just yeah. want to keep getting better and do what I can do. So your your knives, uh, I'm I'm thinking now specifically of the 302. I handled a number of those, and um, they you you also had one in titanium, if I'm remembering correctly. N mm. Maybe I'm wrong. No, that, right next to Mr. Gray. No, so I, Mr. Okay. Gray. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But but the uh, that they're so thinly ground. Uh, at least those 302s. They have really thin slicing cutting blades. They come to a nice acute point. Um, tell me about so you you get you get these blanks back and i'm not trying to steal your process you get these blanks back they're heat treated um and now you're setting setting forth to grind uh take us take us in your in your um shop um, with you and, and and tell us what yeah. that's like well it's i mean when i get when i get something back um okay like you know here's here's a blank it's a paranoia blank that i got back so if you see you'll see all the the cross hatch grinding that's going on it so yeah. this is decarb free magna cut um for these knives and the 302s i prefer working in 532nd 0.156 um i don't i mean for these somebody just went by quick <laughs> um that used to be me <laughs> um uh you know i i don't want to do quarter inch thick you know that that whole you know, too thick or too thin kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm looking for that 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 sweet spot. You know, for for whatever knife I'm doing. So five thirty second for for these and the three hundred twos really is the sweet spot, I think. So after I get them back from heat treat, um, 
I'll clean up all the profile because um, there's still like a curve there from, you know, water jet, laser, whatever, you know, whatever right. process you haven't done. Um, you know, if I, if I have to ream anything out, you know, I'll ream it out for, you know, standoffs. Um, I'll surface grind, you know, surface grind the, the um, you know, the, the sides, you know, to clean it up, to get rid of, any, you know, any kind of, you know, scuff, scratches, you know, if I, if I want a real clean machine belt finished knife, you know, it's, it's got to be clean. So I'll yeah. clean it all up. And then, um, and then uh, I, I just, I mean, from grinding knives, I know, like, I don't need to put, you know, scribe where I want my, you know, bevel mm -hmm. height. I just, I just know. So I, I can go to, go to town. I'll, I, I, I freehand grind and I fixture grind. So depending on the knife and what's happening, um, I'll do either. Well, so what, what is, uh, what does determine, is it, uh, like if you have time, uh, say, say it's on, you said it depends on the model and what's happening. Is, is, is it uh, a yeah. matter of kind of getting it? I got a whole bunch of these to do quickly. Let me put this on the fixture. So I'm not messing, messing if, around. If I'm doing like a run, if I'm doing a run, I, I want a fixture. Okay. It just keeps everything that much more consistent. Um, so I'll, I'll fixture grind, you know, if I'm, I'm, if I'm doing a run of, you know, 10, 10 of something and it's all the same and I want them to be as close as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll fixture, I'll fixture grind. Um, and I used to, I used to suck at fixture grinding. When I first started, I, I, I tried it. I couldn't do it to save my life. Really? Oh, it was horrible. It was horrible. Be because the assumption is that it's easier, but to me, I don't think it's easier. I would imagine it's just different. You gotta like, there's a whole other bit bunch of parameters to get you to get that steel looking right. It, it's different. I would say it's different. Yeah. But yeah, but I, I absolutely sucked at it. So, I, you know, I threw my homemade fixture out the, the window and just started. Just, well, just, I've heard that 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 feedback that you get from actually holding the blade is very valuable um, or can be very valuable, at least when you're starting the, you know, how the tactile feedback that you that you feel through the knife as you as it's on the uh, the we uh, the the belt. Yeah. Yeah. There's I mean, you feel heat, you feel pressure, you know, you rock your body a little forward and, you know, then 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 you're, you know, you got more pressure going up towards the tip or you. You know, push your belly in a little more, and then you know, so you're pushing in, you know, you know, the spine a little more, yeah. um, you know, raising a bevel up higher. Um, it's you know, it's I don't know, it's kind of like a it's a groovy thing. I don't know, it's the yeah, yeah, it's like a feel and flow thing. Absolutely, I'm guessing. I don't know. I no, wish absolutely, I would, absolutely. I wish I had the experience. Absolutely. So the the knife you're holding, the blank you're holding in your hand, the paranoia. This is a um, yeah. So that one, I, I've only seen pictures of this as a standard knife, but it also looks like it would be so wheat as a large pickal, uh, just because of the angle of the tip. If you had it in, in that reverse grip, reverse yeah. grip, yeah, that's pretty sweet. Yeah, it's I'll, I'll, I'll be doing uh, one or two, you know, either double edged or maybe put a little more of a, a curve in here and, and put an edge down here at some point. And the same with the 302. Actually, the 302, there's a little thing I want to do just to give it a little little extra piece of material. So on another run, I may do a little variation and um, do some um, with that reverse edge design. Because it, it feels good. It feels, yeah. you know, and I think it's just from playing with the standard design, I, it, it would cross over nice. Right, right. Okay, so uh, tell me about your sukamaki wrap, uh, your Japanese wrap, and sometimes you put even a little, um, I can't remember what it's called, but the little... Manuki? Yes, yes, under uh, Manuki, under the under the wrap. How did you learn to do this, and, and why do you choose this as opposed to um, handle slabs? I mean, I know you use handle slabs also, but why go for that traditional wrap? I just, well, besides, besides liking it, <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's, uh, it's, I think it's got a place. Um, I didn't always like wraps. Hmm. Actually, I hated wraps up till, you know, a couple years ago. Um, most wraps I, I felt 
that were you know predominantly on like production knives they were they were loose yeah. and squishy and there was nothing attractive about holding a loose squishy handle you know especially on you know an edged you know tool like yeah. if it's like rocking and rolling in your hand that's that's not right so i really i didn't like it um and then you know hanging out with uh john a bit um he was really uh into doing some raps at the time when i had first met him and playing with his knives like i kind of really started to appreciate him again because he was bonding his raps and mm. just doing some really neat stuff with it um so that kind of steered me in that direction of wanting to play with raps again um or at least uh, accepting them i mean um mm. so um you know going from yeah i never want to do a rap i don't like it to uh yeah i think i might like this and i want to do more of it so i mean i was i was just using some stuff and i was just doing a real simple actually here's a shop knife this is this is a this is this is a design i've been doing for years but just this this oh nice this heavy duty i mean i i used an abuse i use and abuse this thing right um you know it's my throwing knife it's my box knife it's my i gotta chop some metal knife <laughs> but but that that cord there like initially was what the wrap i was doing um and a lot of people liked it because it, uh, it, it's bonded it's rock solid it's jute right uh no it's it's like it's a poly it's a poly uh, oh, okay poly cord kind of stuff um and it's it feels really comfortable and it takes it takes a beating it's really it's resilient so i kind of really got into that and then i started to um really admire some of the the japanese rap stuff and um the variations of it and uh, so i started um uh, just to learn um you know, I would play with, um, you know, like a, like an Edo and uh, I would kind of butcher it. You know, I wouldn't be doing it for real to fix on a blade, but just just learning. Yeah. Yeah, you know, just playing. Um, and then, uh, you know, I kind of had it down to where I felt pretty good about it, but there was still some like little things about it I, 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 I didn't like. And, uh, and one day I came across a book. And there was just that one little last piece of information in that book that wow. kind of said, do this. And that was the last little thing that I needed that that kind of changed my rap into something that I felt was acceptable. Can, can I tell you something that, uh, first of all, I love the Japanese style rap. I love it for its looks and feel, but I also love the utility. You know, this is, this is when you turn it on its side, I love that you have all peaks this is not a perfect example of what i'm talking about but you get alternating peaks and then between those peaks are grooves and your fingers like sink into them i, I think it's some of the best grip ever like on some cord wrap knives that are definitely supposed to be tactical that i own i don't miss not having a guard i don't miss not having quillians because of those alternating peaks they just grab the hand so well did somebody and give you that Somebody give me uh, for that razor? Yeah. Uh, All right. uh, Aaron? Uh, yes. Yes. Exactly. That's cool. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Another knife making Aaron I'd like to talk to. Interesting guy. Um, but there's something that I, when, when I look at our Japanese rap, I have a little finicky thing that I like when uh, the, when the cloth meets. I like it to wrap around itself and go back or or come over and turn so it makes a higher peak that's all i'm getting at is that uh, they're not they're not crossing over flat they're somehow twisting and causing a higher peak yeah 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 there's there's all little nuances to it um and um <laughs> yeah I, I i mean i've like you were talking about manuki yeah um you know i i kind of got my wrap to where i liked and then i start throwing um manuki's into the the picture and then i had to start learning how to you know you know set the manuki's in there nice um look at that okay so is that know, ray skin under there so yeah this one has this is yeah this is one of the, the um paranoia oh. prototypes but uh yeah there's black black ray skin 
Wow. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about on your rap. See how? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, I like the way it's it's not crossing over. It's it's looping within and and pulling back. Anyway, so the Manuki idea uh, or, originally was to cover the pin on a samurai sword, um, you know, and then it became more and more ornate and uh, or or meaningful. Not necessarily ornate, but meaningful. Um, what what? Do you like about putting the Minoki? Man, Minoki? Minoki. I, I say Minoki. Okay. And then, and then, what what do you make them out of? And what's what you know? What do you wh it, tell me? It about all that. depends. It all depends. Um, like on this one, um, this was bone. I did a couple bone uh, Minoki. So you know, I just did diamonds. Um, uh, you know, faceted diamonds. Um, I've done some with carbon fiber in there. Um. A few knives uh, people have sent me uh, Manuki to, to, to put in, uh -huh. you know, under the wrap. Um, so it's uh, yeah, kind of, I'm open to anything. Um, uh, I've got a friend that has some old piano keys, just the, oh, the, the faces cool. of them. So the ivory faces, I think, uh, you know, that might be neat. I don't know. So... They bulk up the grip a little bit, right? They also give you a little bit more of a, um, a little bit, to, yeah. To put in your palm, yeah. That get, yeah, it definitely gives a little a little palm swell in the in that area. Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah you see. can really see what I'm talking about from this angle, like the the way, like how, why that is such a good grip. You can see where your fingers are going to go. You can, you know. Yeah, it so it it definitely it definitely feels good. I don't put them on the three hundred twos. It just doesn't. It doesn't it doesn't flow to me it doesn't feel like it increases any value in the hand it does you know it just doesn't feel any more comfortable there's nothing added by it right. so less is more on those oh okay i so uh, tell me about like this is now a business for you not now a business this is a business for you and um so i think knife makers uh at least this is this is what i feel my conflict would be the the difference between or the part of the job that's the great part that you love the making of the knives the 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 quiet time in the studio or not so quiet time so to speak in the in the shop uh, but the time alone working on your perfecting your craft and making your things versus okay how much steel am i going to order um or the, you know like when i asked you that pre blade show question it's kind of like how do how do restaurants figure out how much fish to buy like i that's one of those things about business that maybe I don't quite get for you and knife making. What, what was it like getting used to the business aspect? Well, to start, I still have a full-time job. Mm -hmm. So but, yeah, I have, you know, so 40 hours a week dedicated to, to doing something for somebody else. Sure. No, I, I kind of figured that, but, but you're still, you, you've got something you got to support this. This is a, you know, so the rest of the, the other 40 hours, yeah. Are, are here and you know it and some weeks some weeks you know i just have to pay attention to the family other weeks my wife and kid they they realize i'm going to be out here and if they need need me just to you know come out here and get me but as, as far as like the business aspect you know materials tools i mean all of it it's just a it's a constant it's a constant thing like in the back of the mind you know, um, you know, if, if you're making a bunch of knives, that means you're using a bunch of material. Yeah. So you have to constantly replenish and 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 have the means to replenish it. You know, um, so it's it's just uh, you know part of it. I, I mean, I like looking for material, new materials, new hardware. Um, I, I like doing all of that. Um, so. I mean, really, every bit of the the knife making thing is to me. I'm 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 happy as could be. None of it really is a hateful experience mm -hmm. to me. <laughs> well, you're talking about new materials and researching new materials, and then and you showed a blank earlier of Magna Cut. What has been your impression of working with Magna Cut? And uh, you know, tell tell me what you think of that steel. Well, it's it's legitimately a great steel. It's good. I mean, hands down. Um, you know, the hardness, 
depending, you know, if you want, you know, 62, 65, you know, it, it has its place, you know, 62 gives you, you know, better toughness. 65 is going to give you that, that longer lasting edge retention. Um, but grinding it, like, you know, making the making sparks part of it, it's, it took me, uh, took me a couple blades to, uh, kind of get the hang of it, you know, going from like AEBL or CPM 154 or, uh, you know, some carbon steels, you know, uh, W2 or uh, ADCRV2, it, the, the grinding changes, it, it takes a little longer. You got to go a little slower. I mean, that's, this is my experience. Mm -hmm. Um, you go through belts a little more. It's, right. You know, it's it overall, it's a more consuming metal to you know to work with. Um, you know, it, it eats up your uh, you know your supplies, but the end product is is awesome. So it's it is what it is. You know. Yeah. I, I have one Magna Cut knife and uh, or one knife in Magna Cut from American Blade Works, and he did it beautifully. And it really is one of my sharpest knives. And that actually doesn't really have to do with the blade steel as much as his his own you know work. It was really good. But I'm excited to have Magna Cut, and and uh, it's on a user. It's on a knife that I carry and use. So I'm excited to see um, you know what my um, <laughs> what my results are. Here's my problem, Aaron, is that I hardly use my knives. Like I have to come up with reasons because i have such a modern suburban life that uh you know i got a whole bunch of knives on me just in case a cutting chore comes up and uh um but w you know with the mean, knife most of us that's yeah. most, that's i you know um i used i use my knives more for knife making you know than anything. Yeah. but i i also you know i i like being outdoors so and doing stuff, you know, either around the house or, you know, a little more outside. Um, so, I mean, I just, I've always used knives, I like carrying them, I like using them. So I, I always try to find a reason, you know, yeah, to, to use something. But typically if I'm sitting here, I'm opening a package, I'm cutting a string. Yeah. You know. Um, hang on, getting back to the Magna Cut, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, is, is there a demand, are people asking, you know, can you, this is a great knife, but can you make it in Magna Cut? I know a lot of production companies kind of uh, had, were dealing with that pressure, but uh, does, do you? There's a demand. There's okay. a demand. Um, my customers, um, they kind of ask for all different stuff. But, Who is your customer? Uh, you. Him them you know okay. it, it's i you know i just um yeah who is my customer i don't know man <laughs> you know um i've got customers all all over from you know yale to jail uh, <laughs> awesome. i don't think i have like a specific you know niche right i mean because i could i could see your work in the hands of military uh, people, specialized people. I could see it in the hands of law enforcement. I could also see um, that I have a, a class of individual that I call the classy assassin. And it's not like, um, you know, not, I mean, like you're, I could see your, your knives in a John Wick movie. You know, they, they have real style and real beauty. They also have a bit of menace. Uh, you're welcome. They have a bit of menace, which I always like. And I think, I think most knives should have some, um, but yeah, so asking about your customer, like I'm sure there are a lot of collectors, but I'm sure there are a lot of people out there using them too. Um, you know? Law enforcement. I have a lot of a lot of good customers that are that are law enforcement, um, military as well. Um, you know, either active or retired. You know that that's um, yeah, um, just just all all kinds. Uh, I have some customers that really want to focus on one design that I do. I have um, one one fellow. Uh, he loves the, the the DMFs, so he wants DMFs, and he you know, um, and he's he's a great guy. You know, um, uh, then you know, uh, one fellow, well, one of the few people that I will actually do a little bit of you know custom 
custom mm-hmm. for custom like doing custom work really isn't isn't my thing right. closest thing to custom is i want to do something new so i'm going to do it but if somebody comes to me and says hey can you do this 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 i'm like eh, it's you know like i can maybe point you in the direction for somebody who will mm-hmm. but nine out of ten times that's it i'm not going to take it on i'll be happy to help somebody as much as i can but but there's one fellow that you know we work together well you know we're like minded or my flow and his flow works well together so um he's law enforcement um so uh, so uh yeah my customers are all over I, i've got some guys that want to put stuff in a case and let it be pretty i've got some some folks that want to use the heck out of it so it's yeah. well, well you're your work is that it is very pretty um i have no doubt that it's that it's very effective but how much you know you went to art school obviously aesthetics mean something to you how much do they matter in knife making to you i think they matter a lot you know i mean i mean you you probably know first thing that's going to get you is seeing a knife you see it and then you want to go pick it up the next thing and the next thing you know you're feeling how it feels in your hand you know you're thinking oh it feels good it doesn't feel good you know whatever's going through your mind um so i mean it's it's a very visual thing to start with um and i mean over the years you know um my design aesthetics you know i think i'm i've been able to bring them more to the surface on what i really want to do or just growth you know i i've 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 grown. So what I put into designs definitely have changed. But I, I, I mean, I still really think an honest knife is an honest knife. You know, a good knife is a good honest knife. You know, it doesn't it doesn't need to be a peacock. Yes, a good knife. You know. Yeah, it's like uh, what I tell my daughters. It's you know, um, go for the substance. You know, over the looks. Don't 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 don't. don't turn your back on the looks because they do have some bearing on how that person values themselves, but it's not about how they look. It's about their substance. And then it's about how they, you know, so anyway, uh, that's, that's my way of trying to keep boys away from my girls as long as possible. Um, But yeah, I think, I think you're right about that. The first thing we see, I mean, when you walk into blade show, it's that overwhelming sensation of, I have to look at every single knife in this room because every other room I go into where there's a cool knife, I look at every knife in that room. It's just, it's just never millions of knives like it is in that case. Um, so it's it's a real, uh, I don't know, I just feel really compelled that way. Um, uh, but you were you were talking about um, you, you, your first impression is you look at that knife and then you pick it up and then you use it. And then that's where the connection is made. It's uh, again, it's like it's like being attracted to a person uh, and then you go out to dinner with her and she's got nothing to say. And you're like, oh, that that blows it all. It's the same thing with picking up a beautiful knife and then realizing this thing weighs like 50 pounds. I'm never going to carry it or it's too thick or the grind is bad or the heat treat is bad. Then everything goes out the window. Like my Rambo three knife. <laughs> I hear you. You know, I hear you. Um, it's yeah. I mean, the, the, the function of thought might be there, but the, the reality are, you know, are we going to carry it every day? You know, you know, in our environment, you know, that's, that's two different worlds, you know, being, you know, an act of service versus actively going to the post office. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So who are some of the makers that influence you in terms of their work, uh, both in use and how that, how it looks? There's, I mean, there's more than a few. Um, I got to tell you about somebody you've probably ne- never heard of. And most people have probably never heard of, um, this gentleman he did not sell knives to the public Hmm. he only sold knives to enlisted men and either you know uh the army rangers or navy navy seals um you know he did that through the you know 60s 70s 80s um into the 90s i think so he had a long career um but his name is richard batson um if you you know if you do a little google search for um for him you'll, you'll you'll see like the smithsonian has uh you know one or two of his knives um i came across his work in a um, knife museum about an hour from from phoenixville out in lancaster Mm. 
Um, it's called the American Edged Weapons Museum. Um, it's really cool. It's, I mean, it's an old bank converted into this museum. Oh, One gentleman that owns the entire collection, thousands oh, of knives. God. And you're not, you're not seeing, you know, Spyderco or Microtech or anything like that in there. It's all military. Um, you know, proposed military designs or, mm. or designs that were in use from the French Indian War all the way up to somewhat current. So in one of the cases, I came across these knives, you know, with the name, you know, maker Richard Batson. The, 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 the real world knives, they were meant for combat, meant for an army ranger, a Navy SEAL, you know, in that time period with, you know, the philosophy of what a knife should be. Mm -hmm. Um and the fit and finish on these things were absolutely amazing. They weren't frilly. Mm -hmm. all, they were all about function. But every bit of it was refined. Um, it just, it really just, uh, you know, um, just made me open my eyes to, you know, uh, you know what user knife quality could be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it just didn't have to be, you know, a, you know, lick and stick, let's put it together, let's get it out the door. Um, uh, so, and there were so many cool things about this guy's work. I mean, he did, you know, you know, he had different designs, ranger knives, bolo knives, uh, daggers. Um, <coughs> they were the coolest things. He had this saw back that he did, or that he, that he did, um, let's see, triple row saw back. So if you're looking down the spine... Ooh. There's, there's, you know, one, two, three, three rows of teeth, but all, I don't know. If he did, I don't know if he did it by hand or if he used a mill or, or what, I mean, I've spent, I've spent hours, probably days trying to figure out the geometry to do that saw back pattern. Wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's just amazing. So Richard Batson, I got to check Batson, him out. Though. Yeah, just absolutely cool. So that gentleman definitely influenced me. Um, I, I, you know, I've mentioned John a bunch of times. John Gray definitely has influenced me. He's, you know, he's he's a good friend. Uh, I, I, I consider him a friend, uh, you know, a great friend. My daughter loves him. My wife loves him. Um, uh, you know, just just so many, you know, just all, all the people I've you know met along the way. Uh, there's a gentleman named Grant Chambers up from uh, uh ontario um he, his work is beautiful you know I, i've been talking to him since just just about when i first started um you know the type of knives he he does compared to what i do you know we're kind of like worlds apart but his just just what he does is so cool and how he goes about it is definitely you know influencing um yeah so so many cool people yeah, all, all over the world. No, so there's a lot of places to draw influence from, too. It's not just the person's knives. It could be the person's work setup or there it could be the person's process for heat treat or or so anything. True. And, so and the be beauty part about this knife community, um, I'm sure you have you have experienced this plenty is uh, that there's lots of uh, of openness, um, people sharing techniques, people sharing all sorts of stuff. It's it's probably one of the friendliest communities in 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 any industry I've come across. I, I I'd agree. I I can't imagine. I always ask anyone that I know who's in an who belongs to another enthusiast group. You know, so what's the gun community like, or what's the biking community like? And every time it's like, ah, oh, it's cutthroat. I'm like, not the knives. Come over to the knives. <laughs> yeah, it, it just just yeah. The, the, I mean, Blade Show just hanging out. It just it was great. It's yeah. great. Um, so, and in general, it's always okay. great talking. Yeah, I'm sorry I keep interrupting you, but no, I, no, I, you know. I want to know what knife you want to make. You know that maybe is is out of reach right now in terms of your uh, confidence or ability to make, but some something you want to do by the time you uh, hang up your spurs. Oh, there's there's a few. <laughs> there's a few. Um, I mean, right now, for the immediate future, um, you know, folders like this 302 folder, I want to, I really want this to be, come to fruition. I want to, I want to hold it. I want to be able to offer it. Um, I have another um, dagger design 
mm-hmm. on paper that I'm really excited about too. Um, still working through some of the process on what are what I might not want to do with the handle. So, but the the bones, I have all the bones on paper. Um, uh, just yeah, it's just it's just uh, man. If I had all the time in the world, I'd I'd, I'd be able to start making more of those knives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is. That is the thing. It's the time issue. You know, um, I mean, well, like just back to like some other makers, like uh, the Deadlock, the, you know, yeah. Gavin Hawk and that crew, um, like the, 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 the design, the mechanism, all that, like stuff like that to me is really intriguing. Um, so I, I get into the, the, me- the mechanics and who knows, maybe someday making something a little more complex. I don't know. Interesting, because you're, you you talk about uh, an out the front or something like that, and now you're talking about a different um, aspect of engineering. You know, when you're making a fixed blade knife, you're doing some engineering and some building and and uh, and and erasing, so to speak. Uh, but when you're you know when you're doing that, it's 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 a project. Yeah, total <laughs> total total project. Um, it's on some fierce R and D. <laughs> yeah. Do you, would you ever make a sword? I don't know. I, I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say no. I could see. I could see making one for fun someday. Yeah, I could too, especially with that wrap, man. Beautiful wrapped handle like that. But who knows? I don't. I don't mean to. I don't mean to put uh, put ideas in your head. So, uh, where do you want to see Aaron Bieber knives um, in the future? Do you want to grow the company, um, or is this how you want to keep it? I, you know. It's hard to say. I I love every bit of it. I think it would be great to see it uh, as something that could, like, you know, sustain my family, myself. I mean, because if I'm looking at it that way, it has to be able to, you know, support support the family and everything. Um, as far as what I'm making, I just want to continue making. I mean, I, I really do enjoy every bit of it. Um, at the end of the day, I'm just fortunate that I can do it, that I have the time to do it, that I have the means, that I have the tools, you know, that I've got a wife that says, go ahead, go disappear, you know, so. Well, I got to say that uh, to me, um, of course, the the thing that really draws me to your work is uh, the fact that they're small, but not too small, EDCable, beautiful fixed blade knives and and that is so my uh you know at the at this point um i feel naked without a fixed blade and then you know uh, i I always have a folder anyway but but to me that is the thing and i want i want to see more people carrying fixed blades and yours are the kind that could be um that kind of knife that that a non fixed blade carrier could could cross over with because of the lightness because of the flatness because of the ease of carry and then the effectiveness of the knife itself when you have a fixed blade so there's absolutely i mean i for years i carried folders um you know fix just wasn't my thing you know i got into making knives fixes quickly became more my thing and you know as the years have gone by you know have really thought about well i really want to what do I want to carry every day? What's realistic? You know? Yeah. You know, what what's what's comfortable? What's a good package? You know. All right. So I, I have a very annoying question for, for my last question for you. And it's annoying. And I I say that because we both went to art school and this was a terribly annoying question in art school. And it always made me feel like this person doesn't know what they're talking about if they're asking this question. But I'm gonna ask it anyway. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> define define your style. The, define the style of Aaron Bieber knives. I, th- I th- you know what? I actually might be able to answer that. All right. I remember having to, to write that long drawn out essay about what my my work was, <laughs> and and this this is what it is now. It might be not the answer <laughs> you're looking for, but it is what it is. I'm I'm bringing me to the table. I'm I'm bringing what I want to do, you know, um, out there. And I, I think at before Blade Show there was another show. I had a gentleman, another knife maker, really really cool guy, 
he was making these really cool autos with scrimshaw um, scales and stuff. Um, but he came over to check out my work and he goes, you know, I'd be able to walk away and see your work in a year or 10 years and know that you did it because it's because you brought you're putting you into the work. You're not just doing like this, you know, this, this the standard Skinner hunter but he's like you're, you're putting you in the work and that's 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 all that's honestly that's all i can really say i just i'm putting me into it i, I love know. it i love it then i think i must like you because if you're putting you into the knives and that's what they look like man you're you're doing something right i i think you've got some really nice work and i i hope uh, uh well people should definitely go check you out uh at aaron bieber knives on instagram where else can they see your work or what's the best way to get in touch with you if they want? That is it. That is okay. it. Yeah. You know, I keep it real simple. At some point there might be a web page. probably sooner than later. I need to make a Facebook group. You know, I'll do like Aaron Bieber knives, mm -hmm. you know, Facebook group on Facebook. I just, you know, I interact in some of the other groups. Um, there was one called tact ancient city continental. That's, that's a nice group. It's okay. a real friendly, you know, um, it's a, it's a good EDC. You know, around. the overall group, you know, all kinds of people in there. And, um, uh, but yeah, I, I need to make a Facebook group, you know, for myself to at least to have those two platforms. I can't get strung out doing, yeah, 20 platforms. It's, it's rough. Instagram is, it's got to be the best though, because it's pictures and a little bit of text, you know, pictures. That's what drew, that's what draws mm -hmm. us in. That's how I learned about you. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure. You and I are going to continue our conversation for patrons. Uh, I have a couple more questions to ask Aaron. Uh, please join us on Patreon so you can hear that. And uh, otherwise, sir, it's been a real pleasure. And Thanks, uh, buddy. yeah, you got it. I look forward to getting uh, getting a 302 or a DMF one of these days. Sweet. Thank you, sir. Take care. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, sign of a true artist. He is putting himself in his work. And like I said before, uh, what he's putting in is awesome. So I can only assume uh, that's because of the maker. So beautiful stuff there. Um, and I got to say, I really like the look of that paranoid and I would love well, I'm not, I get ahead of myself during these conversations, so we will see. All right. Uh, please join us again next Sunday for a great interview and also Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. And of course, Thursday for Thursday night knives live 10 PM Eastern standard time, right here on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch for Jim working his magic behind the switcher. I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.